If you need to take a quick break, grab some coffee, feel free to do that as long as you promise to put something up on the ideation wall while you're over there. How's everybody doing today? We had uh, one of our panel members get mm -hmm. sick, and so Cheney has uh, graciously agreed to step in, which I think makes this panel incredibly compelling and interesting, talking about the future of government, All right. because we have someone from the state of California, someone from local government, and someone from a nonprofit working with government. And I think you couldn't get a much more well-rounded view than that. So Cheney's already been introduced. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce um, Mylene Garcia. She serves as uh, Oakland as the city's digital engagement officer. She started and leads the city of Oakland's digital design team, a team of user experience researchers, content strategists, and developers improving government services. I probably need these. That's what happens when you turn 40. <clears throat> Additionally, she co-led the development of the city's design lab, a collaboration space for government and the Oakland community. Her previous work includes untangling bureaucracy and advocating for military veterans and their families. She's a proud alumni of Mount San Jacinto uh, Community College, University of California, Berkeley, and current executive master's degree candidate at the London School of Economics. That's a lot. Let's give her a round of applause. We were going to have Kip Harkness here, the deputy city manager of the city of San Jose, uh, but he was unable to make it, so maybe next time around. Uh, we have Laura Kogler here. Laura is the engineering director at Code for America, where she spent the last two years working with state and county agencies in the criminal justice space on projects such as improving access to record clearance services. Before working at Code for America, she was an engineering manager at Pivotal Labs, where she helped uh, clients from small startups to large enterprises deliver high quality software using agile and user-centered design. And then something she and I have somewhat in common, she also previously worked at Lawrence Berkeley and Sandia National Laboratories while I worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab. She was a physicist specializing in scientific software development. And uh, probably like me, she can't tell you much about it because she'd have to kill you, right? <laughs> That's always the joke when you work on classified programs. So we're going to talk about the future of digital services in California. And what I want to say to start, this is not about the future of digital services by the state of California. It's about California writ large. I think that's really important. I want to offer two hypotheses before we uh, jump into questions. That is, we already know what the future looks like. You just have to know where to look. And we have no idea what comes next. So I think the second one is interesting, right? Uh, we, we heard about the rate at which technology is changing and how uh, even just 11 or 12 years ago, if you had one of these, it was a BlackBerry. Now, what's a BlackBerry, right? Um, there's a really great TED Talk, and I'm not normally one to direct people to TED Talks, but Sugatra Mitra did uh, The Hole in the Wall in 2013. And it's about um, self-directed learning. But that's not what I'm going to take away from it today. I'm going to talk about the history of bureaucracy. And so what, what he talks about is basically that government is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it's currently getting. And if that's working for you, then great. And for decades and centuries, that was exactly what it was designed to do. If we think about the British Empire, if you think about expansion across the globe, bureaucracy was training people as, compu as human computers. If you put in one set of variables, you would always get the same output no matter where you were around the globe. And that, by its very nature, is, I believe, why government is so risk adverse. Because taking risk is about doing something different. It's about putting a set of variables in and getting a different answer, not the same answer that's always been expected. And so our entire notion of government has been about doing things in a prescribed way, not doing things in a new way. And so a culture of not having risk tolerance isn't about bad managers. I think it's about a broken bureaucracy that needs to adapt for the 21st century. And so with that, Myling, what is a digital service and how is it different from services that the city of Oakland or other governments provide in a non-digital capacity? I mean, I, I, is this on? Yes, it is. Okay. I, I actually don't think that uh, 
public or digital services are much different. I think that public or digital services are really public services that leverage technology or are delivered through technology. I um, mean, in particular, I think from the standpoint that we're all talking about it here, I really think we're also very focused on technology that engages, um, technology that delivers services specifically. Yeah. Anyone have a different take? No, I mean, that's what I would expect the answer to be, right, is they should be the same thing, and yet, for some governments, they're not, right? For some governments think about doing service one way, and you talk about digital, and that goes someplace else. But it, um, I, I was just going to add, but I think that the opportunity there is that the process and the product are so closely married, it allows us to prototype and innovate in a right. way that I think that has been unprecedented previously. That's great. Mm -hmm. So the follow-on is, why is it so important to be focused on the customer? So I mean, I, th I think uh, all of the speakers today have, have really uh, mentioned, you know, the idea of being user-centered or human-centered in the way that we're thinking about um, our digital services. And I think part of the way, the reason that that's important is just because when you actually go talk to the people who are trying to access the services that you're providing, you find out a lot of really surprising things. Um, so it may not be just that like you need to, to digitize that form like in a direct way. It may be that people didn't know that they needed that form or that people are actually having an unrelated problem that you can solve in a different way. So um, I think to me that's the real value that you get from conceiving of these things in a human-centered, user-centered way and actually then going out and talking to your, your end users. That's great. I, I know that it, I've spent about half my career in government and half my career consulting with government. And when I talk with people in this ecosystem, they have a tough time understanding sometimes who their customers are. And we heard earlier today, your customers are your end users, but they're also your internal users. And so an example that I like to give, I think why government is more complicated than others is a speeding ticket is a customer service. Now, let that set in for a second, because it doesn't feel like it when you're getting it. But on that speeding ticket, it tells you as the consumer, the person that was breaking the law, where to go when to be there, what to do so that you don't get arrested. It also tells the CHP officer when to show up or the local police officer. It tells the court clerk what to type in, what to do. There are all of these different consumers of the speeding ticket, but when you ask someone in the justice space who the customer of the speeding ticket is, you won't get all of those answers. You'll get one of them, right? And so government services are generally a little more complicated, and so focusing on the customer means focusing on a lot of things. It's not super simple. Um, so. Uh, Cheney, you talked about at the federal level a model that the state can learn from. My own opinion is that inside of California, local government is where citizen-centric services and digital uh, services have started over the last decade because people in local government are closest to the, the end user and it's easier to engage with them and the consequences of not engaging with them are um, more direct, right? So how do you marry those two concepts together at the state writ large, right? Not specifically about your role. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's a, an interesting thing because like in the state, a lot of our services, we're almost a pass through because the counties are the ones who actually execute the end service to the recipient, to the, the person who's getting the benefit. Um, and there's certain things that we do that are directly you know, delivered. Uh, but generally speaking, like, so, what the philosophy that you know, my office is around was more top down. Like, let's take a model that works in the federal space and figure out how that works. What we've seen at the county and the city level is that that's where the services actually happen. So they've been embracing a lot of these um, services and a lot of these um, methodologies much more quickly uh, because they have to deliver that service. So that's why you see things more of like, you know, a city putting something up on a Google form to get feedback really quickly. Whereas the state, it's like, <gasps> are you allowed to do that? In the federal space, it would take us six months to put out a form because we had to go through the PRA, different PRA. And it's like, why? And just because we don't want to ask redundant questions. Kind of digressing. But the point is that um, I think what we're seeing is a top-down and bottom-up approach. Um, and I think one of the keys to that in what we've been trying to do as a state a little more is to partner with the counties and the city in a space where we can share ideas and we can talk and we can be like, oh, human-centered design, constituents are users, 
our county partners are users because we have reports that we get from them. We have benefits we give them. We need to sit down and talk. So in a lot of our engagements, we pulled people from the counties to sit there and just the amount of information and the aha moments you get from having that different perspective in the room is incredible. So I think this is a very, it doesn't have to be formalized. It's just a very low touch way for us to communicate better, come down to, um, and we'll get those benefits. Smiling, Laura, any thoughts? Yeah, so at Code for America, we do a lot of work actually with counties because um, as you mentioned, it like that is the point where a lot of these services are actually delivered to to, to the citizens. And um, so uh, it's it's interesting. I think there's advantages and disadvantages to kind of like the really decentralized county based mm -hmm. model, right? Because you have, um, like you said, sometimes you're dealing with smaller smaller offices that it is easier to kind of like get a new idea or something else established or tried. But at the same time, I mean, there's 58 counties in California, and in order to actually get change across the state, that's a lot of different uh, different local governments that you yeah. have to go to one at a time. And so, you know, that's been a challenge uh, for us with a lot of our work. So we, you know, that we see that with our work with the SNAP uh, benefits with Get Cal Fresh. It's mm -hmm. been a long road to kind of get every single county on board. We're we're going to do it by June. It's like it's happening. Finally, we'll be statewide. But um, and also with the, the justice work that we do, um, California's court system is very decentralized. Uh, most of it's administered on the county mm -hmm. level. And there's just such a wide variety of systems people are using, processes, um, you know, technologies. And so it, um, yeah, it's like there's advantages with, with some, some of those counties are able and willing to innovate faster. But there's also real challenges with just kind of getting stuff um, out there to the whole state. Yeah, and there's like a weird dichotomy to that too. It's like, there's 58 counties, so do you go with the biggest county? Do you try to like do it in LA, which is basically like a state, right? Uh, because it's so big, or do you go with a small county because you can test it, this one, but it's like you almost go with like the coalition of the willing. It's like whoever, and sometimes it's so, it's like a weird, yeah, yeah balance. Please, go ahead. I, I was gonna say that I think also, you know, one of the opportunities that we have at the city and the county level is that cities and counties are responsible for the most intimate part of human lives. Um, you know, all the streets, all of the lights, the things that people interact with on a daily basis. I think the question was asked earlier about customers. And I often think of it that businesses acquire customers in cities and counties and governments have constituents. Um, you know, we businesses are driven to acquire customers at the lowest possible price. Um, and sometimes for particularly diverse communities and communities of color, it does take an investment to actually reach constituents rather than acquire them. And there's not really a lot of competition in terms of who's going to provide your streets. It's going to be, in my case, the city of Oakland is providing your streets and your street lights. Uh, you can't hire somebody else to do that. Um, so I think in that, um, a lot of the complication is we're, we've talked a lot about the narrative, and I know we're going to talk about what the state can do specifically. We've talked a lot about how you know we can break down department silos and agency silos, but I think these levels of government, similarly, constituents also don't know who's providing those services, and I think that that's not really a conversation that we've quite had yet to break down those levels of government so that it, the burden isn't on the constituent to navigate that as well. Can you imagine how amazing and what a mess a uh, one giant Slack group for all California employees would look like? <laughs> <laughs> so so you, know, you talk uh, about the role of, of cities. Right? You're closest to the, to the end user. They generally don't have someone else they can go to. Mm -hmm. You have to bring people into the fold and, and help make sure that your whole community is represented. Um, but cities have constraints too, right? Mm -hmm. Funding, the way that, that money flows in California. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that a little bit and also how the state can help, right? What, what could the state do to help the city of Oakland in terms of delivering better services or what can you teach them? <laughs> um, I, think, I think the one thing that we 
could get, obviously, is capacity and I think a sense of priority um, and building capacity with other cities. I think that there are a lot of statewide and regional problems. The governor was just in Oakland yesterday um, announcing his $1 billion initiative around homelessness. Um, and I think that that's a statewide priority. If we picked a set of priorities, whether we're launching it in a city as large as Los Angeles or any of the smaller counties, I think that if we can pick um, initiatives and priorities that cities can share, I think that that's really a, um, a big service to, service to us all. Um, and more equitably, I think, delivering those services um, so that we, in a, particularly in a digital context, I think it affords for a little bit of that um, service delivery or equity in service delivery. Um, I think the other thing that we can teach, I think Oakland's um, approach and delivery um, is one that aims to reflect the constituency that it serves. And I think that oftentimes civic tech um, misses the mark a little bit on that. Um, and I think that Oakland is really striving to do that despite its resource constraints. That's awesome. Do you ever, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you ever run into a situation where what the city is prioritizing and what the state's asking you to do or another, any other entity is asking you to do are kind of in conflict? Like, how do you prioritize that? I just think that's an interesting question <laughs> on priority. <laughs> um, I think every day, and I think, frankly, it's a challenge mm. um, for us. Um, I think that one of, one of the ways that we've been able to kind of look at how we've been able to prioritize the things is, is sprints, frankly. I think mm. that that allows you to have a focus and a target, whether it's designing for a particular project, whether it's 311, whether it's business permitting or... Um, you know, more vis data visualization project that we might be working on. Like those things and doing them in the short term, I think allows us to. The missed mark, of course, is that there are bigger projects and things that I think need further alignment. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, yeah, just ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> I know from, from one of my prior roles working with county health and human service departments, there's always a challenge between funding, right? Most of our funding comes from the federal government, is matched with a certain amount of state funds, then flows down. Um, the County of San Diego did some really great human-centered service delivery work over the last six or seven years um, in terms of how they share data, how they share services across domains, and they did it without help from the state because the state wasn't ready yet to engage in that space. So sometimes it takes local funding and the willingness to go and, and demonstrate something and then send it back up to the state. And I think there's a lot that HHS will, will and has already learned from, from that initiative. Um, so I've, I've been around the world this last year talking with government service delivery organizations and I keep coming back to UK.gov as both the ugliest website but also the best website in terms of finding services, right? It's, it's plain, it's simple, and you can get to stuff really quickly which brings me to California. When you're trying to find something in California, whether it's how do I turn, get a, uh, you know, a, a, a light in my neighborhood back on, who, who's my garbage service delivery provider, where's the local post office, how do I find services, there's no one place to go. How do we fix that problem? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, so, no small problem. Yeah, it's not a small problem. Um, this kind of this this kind of conversation always makes me think of this thing called Conway's law, which is sort of like a computer famous computer science principle um, that somebody came up with, I think, in like the '60s or '70s. That says basically organizations that design systems are constrained to produce designs that are copies of the communication structure of the organization. Yeah. And I think of that a lot with government because we're broken into so many different organizations yeah. and silos and sub things and it's very, very complex structure organizationally. And so in some way, there's just a natural tendency or almost a law for the systems that we design to reflect those structures. But the problem is that those structures are sort of incomprehensible to like most average people who are right. just trying to navigate like and find something that they need. So I think, I don't know how to fight it, because it, it, it is almost feels like an inevitable law of the universe, but I think when once we are aware of it, we can start to try and take active measures to combat it. Um, there's a design idea that I really like, and I don't know who came up with it, but it's just called No Wrong Door. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to be aware of the fact that people might come to your website looking for something else and do your best to anticipate that and try and make sure that you can direct them to the thing that they need. So I had a conversation um, 
with Mike when he was the uh, undersecretary, and I pitched the idea that no wrong door is the wrong way. Now, I think that right where we are right now, it probably is the only way to go about it, but the right way is <laughs> one right door, right? That if, if you have to serve constituents, no matter how they come into the services, that's a lot of effort to help them figure it out, and maybe it's the best thing we can do today. But how do we get to the place where ca.gov Mm -hmm. Right or any any website you go to takes you to one place that helps you find everything. Maybe that's impossible, right? But it feels like it would be far more efficient. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's, oh, please go ahead. Um, I'm so glad you brought up Conway's law because I always joke that it's Tim Conway's law. The way it's like some of these things are structured. Um, joke for really dated for some of you who might not know who Tim Conway is. But, anyway, but I, I like the, the fact you brought up the no wrong door because like I've seen both sides of that, the no wrong door and the one right door, and I've built both and they both horribly fail at one point <laughs> is you're assuming that whoever is the webmaster of that site and I've been that poor soul a couple times um, knows all those different connections and nine times out of ten a link's gonna get broken because somebody updates something um, so there becomes a lot of pressure to like keep the thing updated so what we just started doing was just embedding like a search in it to, that would just bring results and like we think you might be looking for this that's still not a great service so i guess my point is that we have to make it easier for the user who is the state employee to know what partners that they are um, th and and to be able to use it, their knowledge of being in this space for a long time and knowing oh this is the organization unless you're doing this and it's this organization we just have to make it easier for that person to help share that knowledge in a space where other people can consume it. As I've seen, especially in the social service space, where it's like, oh, you can send this patient to this type of thing, but if it's this type of problem, then they have to go to this other space. Right. And that's just tacit knowledge in their heads. And if you don't get that person on that one day, you're kind of out of luck. And back to your San Diego example, they've done a really great job of creating systems to help democratize that. Yes. So, sorry, that was like eight things was... packaged into one, but. <laughs> Anything else? You either want to add before I move on? Okay, really cool. And I know I'm trying to keep us a little short on our time so we can pick up some of the time, plus I have to get back to my wife at the hospital. Um, she had back surgery yesterday, she's doing great. All of you like think happy thoughts for her and I greatly appreciate that. Um, so, the ca ca I was gonna talk about the county role a little bit, but uh, health and human services and justice, right, are, are places and motor vehicle registration are like the three places that at most people have interactions with government or um, you know, maybe garbage service delivery, light bulbs, that sort of thing. Yeah. The counties have a really important role. Um, how, how can they be the hub, right? Can they be the, the middleman broker between the state and cities? Mm -hmm. is, is the, how, do cities work with counties more closely, better than they do with the state? What's been your experience, Molly? Um, I think from a digital perspective, I think that there's probably a lot of opportunity there. I don't know that, you know, we've really broken down the silo, frankly, between what county services provide um, and w what the city of Oakland provides, for example, on a, you know, on a digital platform or an application or anything like that. Yeah. I, I certainly think that we're probably more cognizant of what the county is providing versus what the city is providing, but I think that there's still a lot of gaps there in between the two. And, and Laura, from your experience at Code for America, do you see any of that happening, or is it is, is there a shining shining star use case in California? I know you've got one you want to talk about um, yeah. in Pennsylvania. In terms of people breaking down, like or co collaborating from the city to the county level. Yeah. Oh, I don't have a good one off the top of my head. Sorry. Cheney, have you seen anything? Um. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned it. Um, San Diego 211, I know it's, it, it, it's not a state entity, but I thought that they just did a really good job of using that. Their responsibility is kind of a central hub to expand what they've done to connect people with services better, but then also to do a follow-up. I think that that model is is brilliant and in simplicity, but the work that had to go into that is 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 Herculean. Um, but that's just a good example of like, well, people are already going here. Let's make that better. Yeah. Um, no, I, th I think you're spot on. So for those that aren't aware, uh, two on one services are a place to go to get assistance with county services. I didn't know this existed until about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's called the Community Information Exchange. Mm -hmm. So if you look at 211 Connect, San Diego, CIE, they do they now did their second summit this year mm -hmm. in San Diego. It's an amazing example of how public, private come together to help people get services and keep them wrapped with care in terms of follow up and, and multiple lines of services. It's a really, really cool example. Yep. Um, Anyone in the audience have a really cool example where you've seen multi-jurisdictional collaboration that is something that everyone else in the audience should know about? Yes, in the back. Didn't know we were going to be audience participation, did we? Yeah, <laughs> cool. <coughs> back in 19, excuse me, back in 2012, 19, oh my God. Back in 2012, <laughs> then Governor Brown created the California Governor's Interagency Council on Veterans. And I ran it. And I remember being laughed at when I said, we need to create a safe space where agencies can come together and create a new way of delivering veteran services. I fought to keep us alive for four years. We did a lot of great stuff. I won't go into a lot of detail about <clears throat> how willing the uh, secretaries and departmental directors and chancellors that were a part of the council were to truly participate. That's for another time. But we did some amazing things because we brought people together in exactly the ways you're saying. We worked with the County Mental Health Directors Association to ask which counties are willing to try this program, and the ones that bubbled to the surface were the ones that we worked with, right? And we did things like follow-up calls to get people back into the office to make sure that they didn't fall through the cracks. And so I have great joy in my heart today, hearing all of these discussions, knowing that your office exists. One of my colleagues that used to be at CalVet, Janelle, works with you. And knowing that your office does what it does brings me great joy and hope that with our current governor, maybe we will truly see innovative change like we desperately tried to create between 2012 and 2016. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for sharing. And your name was? Pamela Rosada. I'm currently with the California Research Bureau. Right. So you, if people want to find out more about the details, like maybe you can follow up with Pamela during the unconference space later. That'd be awesome. Um, so, Laura, you were telling me about uh, an example of collaboration in another state uh, in a justice and legislative space that you mm -hmm. thought was a good example. Maybe you could share a little about it. Uh, yeah. So um, one trend that I think um, we're hopefully going to see more of is um, thinking about how lawmakers can actually work more directly with technologists and the people on the ground in the IT space to craft laws that are inform like that are that are considering implementation from the start. So um, a cool example of this um, is that there was a pretty groundbreaking law that passed in Pennsylvania about a year ago. Um, and it was basically one of the first laws in the country that's actually trying to automate the record clearance process for certain types of like low level misdemeanors and things that uh, are eligible in Pennsylvania, and um, they worked really hard, and they had to go through a few revisions of this law, I think, and one of the things that they did is they actually brought the technical stakeholders from the state's record repository into the conversation, and they made revisions to, to the law that were based on the feedback that they got from the technical uh, people. So they were saying, you know, well, actually, this field that you want to use to make the determination isn't in our database. Can you change it? Or like, oh, these certain types of offenses, we don't actually have good data on and we can't automate it. So they actually incorporated that feedback and were able to pass this law that um, is going to be really groundbreaking and is going to help a lot of people. And it's going to be one of the first laws to, to fully like automate some of these uh, record clearance remedies that people are eligible for. And I think it's a wonderful example of the kind of things that we should be doing more. I was reading about that this morning. It's called the Clean State Act. So if folks are interested in kind of looking it up and, and seeing more about it. What struck me is that the challenges that we have in the justice space with data is we've been putting systems in place for the last 25 years that help get through the process of convicting someone of the offense that they committed or, or at least going through the, the, um, the judicial process. But then those same systems aren't being used to make sure that when someone is eligible to have that material you know, removed or restricted on their, on their record, it's not being done automatically. I know that Code for America does that here in California, and this program looks like it's doing the same. Uh, I promised Cheney that I wouldn't put him on the spot about the ODI, so I'm not going to. But I had um, 
the LAO reach out to me about an article that I wrote over the summer last year about how we can build better digital services. And uh, aside from what I think this administration is doing, which I'm hoping will be amazing, my other answer was um, the legislature needs to be more involved, right? Policy makers need to have a stake in designing the service because today, especially at the state level, but it even happens at the local level, uh, policy makers say they want outcomes. They talk about the process, they build legislation. If you look at laws, there's all sorts of notes in the margins that never quite make it through or they, they don't transfer from agency to agency or, or legislative branch to the executive branch. And then they're passed over to the executive branch or the mayor's office to implement. Um, and then people are surprised later when it doesn't do the thing that the policymakers wanted to do because there was a disconnect, right? There was a handoff. And so I pitched the idea that the legislature needs its own service design organization to be engaged with the executive branch service design. Um, so maybe that will come down in the pipe. At the local level, it strikes me that maybe that's less of a problem because iteration cycles are faster. Am I totally wrong? I don't know that our, in practicality, I like to say that we're agile inspired and not really quite <laughs> agile. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, you know, it's funny you bring up policy. I actually think that that's maybe one of the missing components even just on digital services teams. I don't think that we're monitoring policy and its potential impacts as closely. So I, I think I might in some ways, you know, have a, an opposite thought or reaction. I think that, you know, maybe there's some level of investment I think policymakers need to have, but I think that, you know, policymakers tend to legislate design elements. I think everybody's kind of had that experience where some language is required, some button, some field, something is required somewhere or another. And it could be um, that they're not engaged um, in the process, um, but they also don't have any awareness of the process to begin with. So I think even before having a sense of that engagement, I think there's an education I think that needs to have about what this process actually looks like so awesome awesome so we're we're in our last 15 minutes so I want to make sure we give time to the audience to ask any questions but um, what's next if I could act, ask each of you two questions and and uh, if you could take them in order what's next and if there was someone in the audience here that worked for the state for a local government for an, ag an agency that was thinking about doing things different, what advice would you give them given your experience? And Chain, if we can start with you and work our way back this way. Uh, what's next? What's next? And what advice? Um, what's next is, I uh, hope everybody's got their running shoes on because uh, this is the start of the marathon. Um, it, it's a cool time. Um, we have not only a, at the federal level, you have examples at the local level, you have examples of innovation and bringing some of the new practices. Um, but we're also new state government. There's no mystery that Gavin Newsom wrote Citizenville. There's will, there's political will behind it. Um, and one thing I've learned in my experience is that you need a senior level executive who is willing to take a chance and let you do things differently. To, to willing to say like, hey, I know you're not gonna show results three months, six months, nine months, a year out. What I'm looking for are little incremental things and then following up with that where they don't, three months later go, ah, yeah, I was joking, you really do have to show performance. Um, having that level of executive buy-in and that level of freedom is necessary because you're gonna make a ton of mistakes. You are, so now I'm getting into the advice part. Uh, you're, getting, you're gonna make a ton of mistakes, but don't say they're mistakes, they're learnings. Um, and that is important. Give your staff the ability to try some crazy thing because it's that first crazy idea isn't the solution. It's one that comes four ideas after that crazy one that is that real one that will work. But you have to give people that freedom to keep throwing things up there. Um, prototype on paper as much as you can. It's really easy to change a bad idea on paper. It's really hard to do it in code. It's more, it's not hard, it's more, much more expensive. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, going back to my earlier thing, is um, product management. Be comfortable with the idea of looking at a problem and looking at a thing that solves that problem. You can apply it to even to policy. If you think of policy as the outcome that you're trying to guide behavior, be willing to iterate on your policy, be willing to, let's try this, oh, that didn't work, let's rewrite it, you know, and, and not have it be like, nope, this is in stone, in the next 30 years we'll spend fighting that. Like, that attitude is something we have to change. And, 
it's going to involve everybody working together and being willing to to do that. Awesome, Laura. What's next? Uh, so I I I've been loving what everybody else here has been talking about, and I'm going to build on it a little bit. I think um, I. I think the idea of culture change and empowering people like who are government employees and are in these organizations already to do things differently and to take risks is really, really important. So um, there's just a quick story that I really love from some work that uh, one of our teams was doing in Michigan. They were working with like a local office there that did um, sort of uh, helped people get enrolled in benefits. and. Um, we were working with them on prototyping some stuff like ways to integrate the um, application forms for different services, and we were doing some experiments with them with text messaging, and I think as the local staff in this office kind of saw the power of being able to do those experiments and kind of try innovative things, uh, they actually just sort of took the initiative themselves to try uh, an experiment where instead of having people submit verification documents to them to like, for example, prove that they got laid off from their job, they did uh, what they call it collateral contacts. So they would, instead of having the burden on the applicant to provide the documentation, they would actually, the caseworker would go and call like the old employer and see, oh, okay, did this person used to work here? And, you know, et cetera. Um, they got dramatic results. They were able to increase the approval rate for applications like to 93%, and they also found that it saved them time and energy because they didn't have to have this game of phone tag trying to get their applicants to send them all these right documents. and. So anyway, it was hugely successful, but it's not 100% a happy story because in the end, I, I think what happened is that the, you know, the sort of ground level employees who had been inspired to try this you know, experimentation and innovation were sort of told, well, you know what, you can't keep doing this, that's against our policy. And so I think it's like the culture change needs to happen and people need to get excited about trying new things, taking risks, innovating, and we need to give people permission to do that. We need to build the culture in our organizations that will let people do that. I don't know if that answered the question, but. No, that's awesome. Um, and the second half of my question was advice for someone in government, mm. you know. So obviously uh, being mindful about changing the culture, but something else you've learned that like if you could impart this piece of wisdom, it would yeah. save someone else your grief. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. One of the mantras that we kind of have at Code for America is focus on delivery. So like just, just always come back to like, are we delivering the service for our constituents that we need to deliver? Um, you know, setting concrete, measurable goals around that will really help align around a sense of purpose, like, and also allow you to measure progress. And I think that's really an important thing for kind of being able to, to tell if you're on the right course and to motivate people to like get behind that, um, that vision and that goal. Awesome, thank you. I think. Um, I think this is maybe advice and maybe what I'm hoping to see. Uh, I, I think uh, to Cheney's points about failure and, and success, I, I just would love to see, including I think our my own city that I'm coming from, sharing more incrementally. I think the reason why failure seems like failure and that it's so big is because it isn't incremental and it looks less of a pivot or a decision. And I think the more insight people have into that process, the more open the public is going to be and the more receptive they're going to be to the changes that you're gonna make. So I would sh say share and share and share um, as much as possible. Um, I think we talked a lot about, um, kill uh, I think it was Lloyd Levine talked about uh, Google project killers um, earlier, which I thought was amazing. I would love to see governments uh, being more open, particularly technologists, talking about the projects that they're killing um, because they're not necessarily working or they're not optimized or we've pivoted to something else. Um, I think that those are the two things that I would advise and I would love to see. Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing. Let's go to the audience to see if they have any questions for you. Here in the front, Rob. So not to be a downer, but um, a lot of times, a lot of times the things that uh, we try to do, think looking to the future, are constrained by the legacy systems that we have to operate on. So I wondered if any of you would like to talk about how we might aim towards the future uh, and mitigate some of those constraints. That's a tough one. I mean, that, that <laughs> props up in yeah. every large, certainly health and human service, probably justice system, any large yeah. ecosystem, we have systems that potentially are 30 years old. 
and uh, they are so constrained. I, I remember the very first time that I met with a bunch of folks from 18F who were probably a decade my junior, um, and I you know, told them COBOL, Visual Basic, and a couple other technologies, and they're like, I don't even know what those things are. They're so old. Yeah. I can speak to this a little bit. So, I mean, so my background is engineering, and I feel like what I see time and time again when I go to work with um, these government systems is that technology is actually not the constraint. Like the problem, like for the vast majority of the things that we need to build to make government work well, you know, websites, databases, like all of these things are really solved technology problems. And it's just a matter of, I think a lot of times it is, you know, the risk aversion about just not having the institutional willingness to migrate away from the old and try the new. And I think that there are like ways to manage that risk and mitigate it and do these, like, Many people have done it many times, and it's it, it's just a matter of like being brave and mm -hmm. and taking the plunge. I think you have to be respectful too of the legacy system and the work people put into it, because I think a lot of times the resistance is you're killing the system that I spent 20 years of my career in. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it's useless. I'm useless, and that is a mm -hmm. horrible thing to say to somebody. Um, I think, par and part of it, it related to that too is. The fact that it's, here's a system, and it's going to basically be unchanged for the next 20 years. Have fun with that. We have to be willing to, and again, I sound like a broken record, back to the product mentality of incremental changes so that that legacy system doesn't become useless or doesn't become, you keep continuing to improve the thing. You keep continuing to build on it. When you have a legacy system that you need to replace, say, like, this thing has been alive for 30, 40 years. That's a success. It's been doing its job. We're going to replace that. And we're going to take the people who are keeping it alive, and we're going to show you these new tools. You're still going to be part of this. You're going to be trained on it. And the other thing we need to do is, for God's sakes, can we start putting professional services and support into our contracts, too? So it's not just like, read a manual. Good luck with that. It's like, give people the ability to learn as they grow in their careers. I, I know across, sorry. I, cut you off. I know across the state we have a lot of the same legacy technologies. I mean, maybe not the exact same implementations, but a lot of the same sorts of things. And I wonder if taking a page from the firefighting USDS approach, Rob, maybe there isn't a way to build out a team that can go from department to department to help them service enable their legacy technology so at least there's a place to get started from while you deal with solving the, the modernization problem as well so that you're not reinventing it in every department and every organization you're actually learning. Um, I don't know if that's the answer, but, but maybe it could go some way towards solving the problem. Any other questions? Time for maybe two or three. Hello? Good. Um, so I actually have a, a comment and a question. One is that um, I do think that there are some examples of states that have uh, integrated benefits programs that are working, like uh, Arizona, where they where there there are kind of um, health and human services are, are delivered through a, a portal where people can come for the one place to get things that was that was said before one mm -hmm. one door. So I think there's some examples that that work to some degree. I think there's certainly ways that those can be improved. But I I would I would cite that as an example. Um, I guess the question I have is that. Um, is that Meilang? You, you, you had said that, that what we need to do is really to have a place where we share. And I'm wondering, my question is, where is that place to share? I mean, where is the place to kind of exchange the ideas and have the interchange that will allow for better integration and better coordination of services and service delivery? Well, to be honest, I'm hoping that's the state, but <laughs> I, could, I could be overly optimistic. I mean, I think, frankly, the way that it, it has at least worked for me, and I'd be interested in see, hearing what my colleagues think, it's been places like this. I mean, it's the reason why I come to these types of events. Um, I know that the summit is next week. That's another place that I, uh, you know, go to for that kind of exchange and camaraderie. Um, I haven't actually seen even a centralized place online for that kind of ecosystem or sharing, um, despite the fact that we are all digital people and digital humans, I think, in the room. So I think that that's really surprising. Um, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have necessarily the best answer to that, except by le better leveraging what's existing. I think that there's some opportunity to have some structured conversation about that that, I, that may be a little bit absent from the convenings that we do have. There, there's two that I can think of, and I think what you'll find is if you find them, they tend to be domain specific yeah. or they tend to be technology specific, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, Stewards of Change, uh, a nonprofit, has a, a, a hub that they've built over the last year, found, funded by I forget whom. Um, and it's open to government and, pri and private and nonprofit organizations to come and talk about health and human services coordinated delivery. And so they're looking at both policy and technology. So that's what I recommend. And then I just saw something yesterday on TechWire, maybe two days ago, um, uh, a civic-minded DMV GitHub repo that Luke Fretwell set up. Yeah. So maybe, maybe if the state can't take the, the lead on every single one of these, I mean, yeah. that'd be a lot. I know yeah. Code for America does work, there's other nonprofits. Maybe in each domain, someone could stand up a GitHub repo and we could just start talking, mm -hmm. right, sharing ideas. Um, two more. I'll let you. Are we out? Yeah, I think there okay. we're, we're going to try, try to get you to lunch in a reasonable time. Of course, we have to discuss questions. But if you have a question, please come find these folks at lunch and during the unconference. Um, I've got to get out of here. But uh, thanks all for having us. So, big hand to the panel. Thank you.